And then you don't. Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Good evening. Not good night yet. Um, I want to welcome us all to the 2020 CGIAR Convention on Big Data and Agriculture. Even though we're all coming from a lot of different places, we've got a lot of different morning routines. Uh, we're very excited to be convening all of us together on this virtual platform for the next three days. The next three days, we'll be exploring the idea of digital dynamism and how it impacts our virtual, our food systems and our virtual world. So before we get started, I wanna quickly introduce Brian King, Andy Jarvis, and Jawu Koo, who are gonna be walking us through some of our guidelines for the next three days and also some of our very exciting plans that we have in place. Uh, first, Brian, do you wanna give us an overview of the platform? Absolutely, thanks, Shamila. The platform for Big Data and Agriculture serves as a digital practice uh, cutting across all of the centers of the CGIAR organization. We work together with partners, we look at innovation, we look at data standards, and um, we'll hear a little bit more about that from my colleagues. Um, I think it might be helpful if we start out by talking about what we mean by big data. Um, we're not talking necessarily about the relative kind of bigness of the data, we're talking about uh, data that's discoverable, well-described, available and usable and reusable across domains that we can use to solve uh, increasingly complex and knotty problems um, in, in, the, in global food security. Um, uh, of course, that data can get quite large sometimes, but um, really it's about the interoperability, the discoverability, the reusability, and then the partnerships and the innovations that we can, um, we can put this data to use for. Our big data platform has three components and we call them modules and we, are, we will give the quick introduction of each module. The first one is called organized and organized uh, is where we support our researchers to make data open, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable while we strengthen our data science capacity. And Brian? 
Great. Well, our second module is uh, we call convene, and this is about partnerships. We um, uh, we, we we tend to and support uh, technical communities of practice that delve into uh, deeper technical issues around how do we mobilize data and use it effectively uh, for global food security. Um, we also do this annual convention, which is where uh, the communities of practice kind of uh, set the technical agenda together. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of try to foster new partnerships uh, through through engagements in, in our annual meeting. And then it all comes together really where we've got data, which is organized. We have new partnerships and we've convened these new types of partnerships and brought different actors together. And then what we do is we try to inspire with this. And so our inspire module is about providing grant funding prize challenge funding for great ideas that are gonna solve development problems faster and more efficiently. Over the last couple of years, we've been to Cali, we've been to Kenya, and we've been to Hyderabad. And this year, of course, we were supposed to be in Lima, Peru at SIP, but instead we're convening on this virtual platform with our global participants. While a lot of things at our convention are different, we are gonna have some things stay the same, and that's our convention rules. So now I'm going to pass it on to Andy, who's going to start by telling us some of our virtual convention rules. So rule number one, this is a conference with a difference. We strive, we've spent three conferences now trying to make sure that this is an experience beyond the normal conference. And so the mantra about this is disrupting, doing things differently, making for a memorable experience that has you talking, not just on what, the night of the conference, but for the next year, waiting for the next one. Room number two, engage. No audience or participants. Forget emails, don't multitask, just do single task with this one. Uh, this conference shouldn't be used as a background noise, so please engage with everyone. Rule number three, get your nerd on. We really try to foster satisfying, deeply technical engagements. And now you can nerd from the safety of your own home. Rule number four, game on. Over the course of the next three days, we're gonna have photo competitions, caption competitions, discussion board questions, and a whole host of ways for you all to compete and play games and have fun. So make sure you do that. Rule number five, this is a family affair. It's a little bit different to your normal experience. Normally you'd get the conference bus back to the hotel, you'd share your experiences with your colleagues. This time you're sat at home. Get up when it's finished, have lunch, have dinner, have your hot cocoa, your breakfast, whatever it is. Have it with your family and tell them something about what you heard, what inspired you, what captured your attention. Share it with your family. Rule number six, youth ask, you do. We have a very dynamic group of youth and data participants who will be asking you all for quotes, reactions, any other questions that you have with our sessions. Make sure that you engage with them and get them the content that we need to make our print even bigger. Rule number seven, each agriculture and Zoom. Uh, when we were getting together in physical space, we used to worry about lunch delivery and weather and many other things. But now everything online, but that doesn't mean things can go smooth. So things can go really wrong. Uh, that, that's okay and be patient. If your network drops or you miss a session, yeah, don't worry, all the presentation material will be available online for you to revisit later and share with everyone. Rule number eight, self-organize squared. We have to really manage ourselves a bit if we're going to get uh, all of the richness out of this opportunity and create that richness for others. And so plan ahead, think about your engagements with, um, with the sessions, uh, try not to get sucked into email and other distractions and uh, just come prepared. Um, actually, I've got to go prepare for my talk. <laughs> Rule number nine, fail forward. We'll be talking about many innovative and risk-taking blue sky stuff uh, for next three days. Really exciting. So let's learn from each other um, in innovation space and see how you can really make the best out of these new ideas. So rule number 10, and my absolute favorite, rules are made to be broken. This conference is an experience that creates new rules, creates and inspires. 
And so we expect you to ignore these rules if you have a better idea and a better way of doing things. That's really what this is about. You chipping in and contributing and moving us forwards. So those are the rules. What's next, Shamara? All right, thank you, Andy, Jawu, and Brian. So before we get started and learn more about digital dynamism for adaptive food systems, I wanna take a minute and remind everyone that over the next three days, we're gonna have chats, discussion boards, games, live Q and A's and inspire pitches and so much more. This is an opportunity for all of us to really think about the key challenges and how we can come together to solve them. So with that, Brian, you, you ready to give your opening? My name is Brian King. I serve as the coordinator of the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture. And today we're going to talk about digital dynamism. What is it? How do we get it? And what have we learned about it in the last few months? So what is digital dynamism? We've seen the term popping up in the marketing world over the last year or so, sort of in recognition of and taking into account the fact that there is a deluge of data and digital services throughout economy and society that are opening up new ways for us to understand people, to understand their context and their needs and evolving uh, preferences, and to be increasingly take more dynamic and agile action based on what we learn to help them meet their needs. Now, marketing is already a very digital discipline, but over the last six months, there have been some really dramatic changes that make digital dynamism relevant to virtually every industry. In the last six months, the world became radically more digital multiple global studies by McKinsey across industries and organizations have found that digital adoption had accelerated by as much as 10 years across multiple industries. Now, this was true of consumer behaviors, operations, ways of reaching and engaging with customers, supply chains, and more. Now, this is true in the agriculture research for development space as well. Uh, CGIR over the last several months has been engaged in digital strategy research where we conducted semi-structured interviews with a wide swath of the agricultural landscape, looking at agribusiness and food companies, other research organizations, startups, and so forth. And we found some things that were very similar and consistent with the McKinsey work. So things like really dramatic organizational shifts, not just the remote work stuff that we're all doing but you know, new buy-in and recognition from organizational leadership about the importance of data and digital tools to their own mission as an organization. Um, we've seen a sort of heroic rise of IT departments to facilitate a really dramatic change in those organizations in a really short amount of time. New opportunities for applying digital and operations kind of got moved to the front of the line. Um, we saw a solution for uh, machine learning enabled selection of seeds, sorting of seeds that um, gets sort of fast tracked because of the crisis. And we saw renewed interest and investment and attention on digitally enabled agricultural advisory services that you can carry out without having to, to go to the farm um, in the event you can't go to the farm. Um, it's probably not surprising, we saw as well a lot of increased demand for data at a time when uh, movement was constrained and you couldn't be out collecting farm uh, data or other types of data. Um, and lastly, I think there was, you know, one of our interviewees stated it very nicely when they said that computational methods of doing research have kind of fully taken their place up alongside observational and experimental ways of doing science. You know, there were really dramatic changes, not just in the agricultural research for development space, but in broader food systems as well. One of the more dramatic things we saw over the last several months was that so many times crises are accompanied by a lack of data. 
So as the COVID crisis unfolded across the world at roughly the same time, thousands of small crises flowed from that and continued to unfold in food and farming systems. And so disruptions in availability of labor, disruptions in the flow of goods and people led to strawberries being fed to cows in India for lack of labor and watermelons rotting in the fields in California for the same problem. We saw countries that were not ready to have their borders closed and immediately lose key uh, regional and global connections for maintaining national level food security. We saw that disruptions in distribution ended up being a significant shock to small producers and thus undercutting the availability of supply, such as happened in small um, aquaculture systems like we see highlighted here from Bangladesh. Another really dramatic thing we saw in the last several months was how quickly a number of food systems around the world localized, and particularly in places where there were social media or mobile solutions or other digital ways of connecting buyers and sellers and distributors and so forth. You know, the, the demand for those services and the use for those services went up really dramatically. And in places where uh, they, those mechanisms were not there, where it could be, it seems like many of them sprang up almost overnight. So while this localization is really interesting and I think important for, for long-term health and resilience and food security, another thing that came into really sharp relief was how important global connections are as well. It's estimated that about a third of uh, the world's food trade involves low and middle income countries. And that is a critical part of how we are configured today for maintaining something like global food security. So we need both the local and the global mechanisms and clearly digital cuts across both of those. When we look back on the COVID crisis, we may well look back on it as a triumph of open, global, data-driven collaboration around a common problem. There's nothing quite as emblematic of that as the COVID-19 open research data set. It's a, an open public repository of scientific publications that continues to grow just on de dedicated research into coronaviruses and into COVID-19 specifically to accelerate global learning and action on this common problem. We've seen as well some innovations in how uh, sensitive or private data can be masked and used responsibly, but still unlocked in terms of the analytic power that it gives us to understand at a population scale how this crisis is unfolding and what we should be able to do about it. We've seen as well mobilization of massive computational power to begin to accelerate the search for solutions. And you know, much of it in kind from the likes of Hewlett Packard Enterprise and IBM, specifically accelerating research into this global challenge. I think we're starting to see global food security research go through a similar shift. And in fact, we'll learn about a few more examples of that over the coming days and have the chance to engage with each other around bringing this shift into being. Now, certainly from where we sit at the platform for big data and at CGIAR, we're seeing this upswell in interest in partnering to build these new agile, large scale capabilities for global food security. We've been fortunate to be able to link up CGIR researchers and centers and programs with X, the Moonshot Factory, formerly known as Google X, on the ground partners like Plantix and Digital Green and One Acre Fund, and the Media Eye Company that produces the really popular TV program Shamba Shape Up and the iShamba uh, digital platform that's complementary to it. Um, because of the, the footprint of, and of the par partners and the data available, uh, we decided to focus in on maize in East Africa. And so jointly, the, the partners pulled together data, modeling capacity, and computational power to begin to look at the major maize growing regions in Kenya in the 2020 season to see if we could detect crop type recognition from space, detect the onset of a 
healthy population of maize in, in maize fields? And could we predict something about the yields from those fields? Well, the partners didn't solve everything they set out to, to solve. We didn't improve crop type recognition this season. Uh, we weren't able to predict much about yields uh, this season. Over the course of the season, though, um, we came to feel pretty comfortable with the new capability to detect onset. So, you know, the establishment of a healthy, uh, hopefully, population of maize in those fields. And this enabled us also to make a, a rough calculation of total maize planted area in this season that seems to be being borne out by ground data and, and, and ground validation. And so in this season, we did not achieve delivering um, a really dynamic in-season analysis. However, I think we learned a huge amount about the nature of partnerships required. And I think that the crop onset analytics could well be a very great dynamic monitoring capability for future seasons. And so these open collaborative global collaborations around food security are clearly the way forward. We need to keep building them. And it's not because there's a lack of data necessarily or a lack of political will. I think it's probably a bit more kind of, you know, a question of balkanization. So, for example, there are systems out there for monitoring forest populations. There are systems and methods for being able to detect changes in wealth and poverty in a really high frequency way. There are methods for being able to monitor prices, monitor prices. There are ways to monitor fishing or solutions that are showing us the way to be monitoring fishing. We can look at how harvests are unfolding through a combination of ground data and remote sensing. So it's not necessarily a lack of know-how or even potentially a lack of systems. It's really about the kind of unifying global collaborations that can help us use these systems and tools and know-how to build these global capabilities. One of the things we've seen in the last several months is that global food supply and value chains are significantly more vulnerable than we thought they were. And so clearly we need to new ways to build these. Um, and we also need to recognize that there are opportunities to build them better. We can make them more inclusive. We can make them more resilient. In fact, there's about a 20 year history of research and investment and countless consulting hours, certainly in trying to figure out how to make global supply chains more resilient. And a review of that literature actually is a little bit discouraging because it's successive shocks. It's uh, acts of war and financial crisis and natural disasters and so forth. And it seems that when you review the literature, the learning is always a bit sort of retrospective. Okay, that shock happened. How do we manage that particular kind of shock? And so, you know, there's, if you look back through this literature, there's this sensation of, oh, here we are again. So, as discouraging as the literature review might appear, there's actually a signal starting to come through that points to the role of knowledge management. There's a particular paper that called it that and sort of put all of this into perspective for me. And I'll take the liberty of including data and digital tools and um, managing the exchange and availability of information to all be rolled into knowledge management in this paper from nine years ago now. But what they were able to measure specifically was that there was adaptiveness, dynamism. There was specifically uh, flexibility, visibility, velocity, and collaboration that were fostered across supply networks and across distribution networks in um, across multiple supply chains. This is clearly applicable to our global food systems and our global value chains and our local ones for that matter. What's also very interesting about this is that they're describing a two-sided network or a multi-sided network. They're describing one of the definitions of digital platforms. 
And so what this says to me is that part of building digital dynamism is enabling there to be as many interoperable multi-sided networks, interoperable digital platforms as there are problems to solve. So I think there's a key linkage between this idea of interoperable, interoperable platforms and the idea of resilience. Now resilience is often defined as the ability to manage or recover from shocks. Um, it's also a very nuanced and multifaceted concept that means different things in different contexts and even in different research domains. The shocks themselves are quite diverse. We've seen with the COVID crisis, how thousands of small crises can unfold differently in different ways around the world. So what digital dynamism opens up for us is the possibility of moving beyond simplified models of the world to being able to hyper-localize, to understand changes in fluid and dynamic context and to act with agility and precision amidst that complexity. And so we'll be looking into this over the coming days together. How do we build these dynamic, global, adaptive capabilities? On Wednesday the 21st, we'll be looking into computational sustainability, this transdisciplinary field emerging where we take on the full complexity of an already complex and nuanced concept, which is sustainability. In the session on digital innovation in the time of COVID-19, we'll be looking at how do digital innovators and those who wish to source and foster digital innovation, how are they doing business differently in light of the global crisis? Digitally enabled farmers will tell us about the digital and their own operations over the last several months and where they see themselves going from here. We'll talk about this data question. How do we address the need for dynamic, high frequency, global and local data to enable the kinds of collective actions that we need to be able to enable? Digital dynamism across CGIR will be featured in a number of ways. And there's a session on overcoming lockdowns and what's happened with agricultural research for development in light of those lockdowns. And then there are these vignettes in the virtual booths specifically about what centers are doing um, with data and digital tools in the context of their specific research. Pass by those booths as well, and you'll see uh, some vignettes from each of our Inspire Challenge finalists, the uh, uh, CGIR uh, uh, Signature Digital Innovation Process, the Inspire Challenge. And you'll also see some really great tech demos and technology showcases. And so um, this is a time to learn together to mobilize together and hopefully to inspire one another to build the new digitally dynamic global food system that we all desire. I thank you. Enjoy the convention. Welcome everybody to our session on computational sustainability. Um, I'm really happy to uh, have Dr. Cheryl Palm and Professor Danielle Wood join us uh, for this cross-disciplinary discussion. Um, agriculture research for development is almost staggeringly complex. Um, we need to be look at constantly evolving state of economy, society, the biosphere and how food systems and food security fit into that constantly evolving and dynamic picture. Um, as a result, uh, the analytic approaches and uses of digital technology continue to evolve as we seek to kind of manage and understand that complexity. And so 
Today we're going to be looking a little bit about how analytics will help us to um, really sort of thread this needle. How do we look at environmental, socioeconomic, biodiversity, biodiversity and conservation goals um, and sort of look at how do we navigate that complexity together. Um, so to explore this, um, I'd like to first uh, uh, hand off to uh, Cheryl Palm. Dr. Palm is a research professor in agricultural and biological engineering and associate director of the Food Systems Institute at the University of Florida. She's a biogeochemist and tropical ecosystem ecologist, and her research focuses on land use change and degradation and rehabilitation, ecosystem processes in, in agricultural landscapes, particularly tropical landscapes. Uh, she's led major uh, efforts in quantifying carbon stocks, losses and net greenhouse gas emissions um, in uh, land use systems in the humid tropics in the Brazilian and Peruvian Amazon, Indonesia and the Congo Basin. And she spent much of the last 20 years investigating soil nutrient dynamics in farming systems in Africa, including options for soil and land rehabilitation. Dr. Palm's most recent work investigates the trade-offs and synergies among agricultural intensification strategies, the environment and rural livelihoods, including nutrition and income generation. Um, over to you, Dr. Palm. Hello, um, thank you for joining us at this um, exciting and uh, event on big data and agriculture. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be here today. Um, first of all, I ask why me? Why do you want me to be doing this in big data when I have lost all ability to even run an Excel spreadsheet? But then I guess I'm privileged to have traveled the world and seen many agricultural systems and to be old enough to have seen a lot of transitions in agricultural research over the last 30, almost 40 years. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a bit about trends in agricultural research over the long term, but then over the last couple of decades. And we'll talk about why research is done, by whom, where, and how. First of all, research is done in agriculture to solve a problem. Um, and so different interventions come as different uh, problems evolve. And so in this graph that you'll see on the left from Ruth DeFries's book, The Big Ratchet, she actually looked at when food production had stagnated, when more people needed to be fed, and looked at what happened. So if you go back millennia, people started domesticating wild species to get higher yields and to grow them in place. You go a few millennia forward, a couple of centuries ago, and you start needing to plow and the invention of the plow by Jethro Tull. And then you go on a couple more centuries back and the need for nutrients and sources of nutrients, manure, guano, and things like that to produce food and higher yields. And then we get into more modern agriculture, as we call it today. And the graph on the right is a graph from Erie, the Rice Research Institute, looking at yield gains over um, since the 1960s, sort of the advent of the Green Revolution until 2010. And you'll see the early interventions were basically crop breeders, um, looking for shorter varieties that wouldn't lodge. Uh, they looked at different durations. Then they started to have to look at pests and diseases. And they bring, start bringing in soils in the 80s. And water and irrigation um, starts coming in in uh, the early the, the 80s and 90s. But you'll see as we increase, it gets more and more complicated what the issues are, what kind of scientists you need, tillage, integrated pest management, and all of that. So as we come today, it's diversification, water saving irrigation, efficiencies, e ecosystem services. So we've now come to this place where you need a variety of scientists working on complex issues. Okay, now I'll briefly just talk about who does the research and where it's done. That's also changed over time. First, a lot of it was, most of it was on station and in labs by individual scientists. Crop breeders looking at germplasm in the field, um, and then it started working on labs, um, 
um, pests and diseases, and then soil scientists came in and hydrologists. Um, as people found out, many of the on-station work, it wasn't relevant to smallholder farmers, so a lot of uh, research was done on farms by teams of scientists and somewhat by farmers. It was research designed and managed, researcher designed, and then it went to uh, farmer, researcher designed, farmer managed, and then fi finally farmer designed and farmer managed. And it was both biophysical and social sciences. And now I think you can say we talk not just about farm fields, but farms and landscapes. And that's where a lot of research is going on right now. Um, and it takes interdisciplinary teams of scientists, whether it be an agronomist, an ecologist, an anthropologist, um, but it takes a, a broad range of people that are able to speak together. It takes farmers and communities um, to make this come together. So, as you think about how research has changed and the problems have changed, think of how those tools have changed. Now, most of the people in the room listening know a lot more about these tools than I do, but just so you can see how things have changed, many of these changes, most of these changes in my life as a research scientist. Crop breeding went from basically observational crossing of phenotypes to today's fancy genomics, CRISPR technology, and things like that. That's in the last 30 years we've gone over that um, dynamic change in research. Data collection has changed, paper and pencil, um, to computers. Um, I will tell you um, that that has changed over my lifetime with paper and pencil. Um, we now have GPS smart devices in the field, as you'll hear during this week. Sensors from eyes in the sky to sensors in the soil to detect uh, chemicals, water, all sorts of things, land use change. Um, analytics. Um, when I started out, people mostly talked about ANOVA and T-test. Now we're into space, spatiotemporal analysis, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. There will be a lot about that also this week. Computing, brain power. People had numbers, they had to crank through things. Um, to brain power plus computers. And I would say from my PhD work, I probably took the first, what was then called a portable computer to the Amazon of Peru. It was to help the scientists start entering data while they were still out in the field. Um, and so that was very interesting that the administrators took it and locked it up and said that was for them and not the scientists. So now we're on to supercomputers. Um, and then communication has changed by word of mouth, radio, and now we're into social media of all kinds to talk about agricultural advancement. So what are the, the challenges we see today? And I've just talked about several of them, but it's to produce more food and nutritious food uh, and to provide that to a growing population while improving the economic, social, and environmental outcomes. And all of that in the uncertainties of a changing climate. So you'll hear many, many types of uh, conversations these days. Uh, conversa conservation agriculture, agroecology, climate smart agriculture, carbon neutral ag, regenerative ag is becoming the term used more now. But I say these all fall under the realm of sustainable intensification. Um, so, in all of these, there are many technologies that do exist. We think they fit many of these uh, sustainability criteria, but how are we sure? What is the evidence base for what works and where does it work? So I think a lot of what people are talking about now is how do we obtain that evidence base? What works where? Um, so you can monitor key sustainability indicators, um, and I have a framework here of the different sustainability domains, productivity, economic, environmental, human, and social. And there are indicators with all of them. Um, and it's the context under which you're studying an agricultural system that is key to see what works where. The problem has always been it takes a lot of data and it's expensive, it takes a lot of time. 
I think we're now coming to the point that there are tools to be able to gather a lot of these different types of data efficiently and to use them efficiently. So who decides this? And this is where the real human component comes in. What are the indicators that are important? And this is stakeholder involvement that's so important. This is just a, a graph of a community to identify what they think are the important indicators for a particular system, how they're linked to other indicators and possible trade-offs and synergies. And then this graph here, it shows how the trade-offs in, in food production um, versus carbon as seen by different stakeholders. Carbon might be very important to an environmental NGO when they're not thinking about food. Ministry of Agriculture is thinking about food production and the farmer is probably somewhere in the middle. All this is important as we try to move forward in gathering uh, indicators and looking at what they mean. Then uh, to talk about sustainable practices, uh, we can now probably determine what is sustainable where in many of those indicators, but are people going to adopt them? These are graphs that I've used many times, some of them are old, but it basically shows that adoption of different um, practices, organic inputs, fertilizers, improved seeds, or integrated soil fertility management, which is a combination of all, are adopted at different rates in different countries. On this graph here in Zambia, you'll see different wealth groups adopt fertilizers or manures differently due to different access. And down here, you'll see that adoption, as adoption goes down actually, the, the cost or the benefit to that goes up. But farmers are not adopting what we call a profitable practice. Why are they not doing that? There are lots and lots of reasons, risk, climate, markets, not that wasn't communicated to them, or do they have access to all the inputs that are needed to do that? Is it culture or is it policies? So I say the time has come and the tools and the people are here in this room to look at managing and combining digital ag, and you'll hear much more about that all week long and in my, my uh, colleague here, Danielle Wood, um, and the eye in the sky to sensors in the soil. And then matching those with farm level data and tools and participatory methods that involve farmers and local stakeholders. These, all, these tools must be available to agriculture and farmers in the global south. And in many cases, the global south is already leading the way. And I'd just like to end by saying these tools and processes and data must be collected and used in a transparent and ethical way. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing many of the talks this week. Thank you, Dr. Palm, for um, this uh, review of agricultural analytics and sustainability and new opportunities to take on the full complexity and perhaps uh, you know, inevitable trade-offs as we, as we embark on these, these, different, uh, these different goals related to this complex uh, you know, concept of sustainability. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce Professor Danielle Wood to look at some of the uh, new methods and measurements available to us as we start to take on and and address that, uh, that complexity. Uh, professor Daniel Wood serves as an assistant professor in the program in Media Arts and Sciences um, and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Aeronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, within the Media Lab at MIT, Professor Wood leads the Space Enabled Research Group, which, seech, which seeks to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Uh, Professor Wood is a scholar of societal development with a background that includes satellite design, earth science applications, systems engineering, and technology policy. In her research, Professor Wood applies these skills to design innovative systems that harness space technology to address development challenges around the world. Uh, over to you, Professor Wood. Hello, my name is Danielle Wood. It's an honor to join today and to follow on the discussion by our dear colleague, Cheryl Palm, and discuss the question of how we are going to take the latest capabilities for making observations about the environment as a way of serving society with space data. 
And of course, as I mentioned, space data, I'm certainly interested in data we draw from other platforms in the air and in situ. But we'll talk today about the complexity that's available today and the way we need to design these systems with justice in mind. I lead the Space Enabled Research Group at the MIT Media Lab. I always try to begin my talks by giving credit to my colleagues and the team and just appreciating their contributions to the work you'll see today. Our mission at the Space Enabled Research Group is to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. And I hope when you hear that mission statement, you're also asking the question of what it means to advance justice. And part of how we answer that is to consider the sustainable development goals as a set of visionary statements that define the future we need to work toward as many countries are adopting these goals as they work toward 2030 to take measurements of how we're making progress in areas such as reducing poverty and making sure everyone has access to food and water and energy sources. I really appreciate how the SDGs include individual and family level needs, but also city scale needs and regional needs, questions around our global consumption and production of goods, and also of course planetary scale questions. How will we mitigate against the already existing climate change and of course reduce future climate change while also ensuring biodiversity on land and in the ocean? So of course this gives us an important set of guidelines to build on even as we're working on issues of agriculture to consider the other broader challenges of sustainability. And our team would particularly ask how the current space technologies plus new ones being developed can be best used to improve opportunities to work on the SDGs. In particular today, I'll show several examples harnessing satellite earth observation, satellite communications and other infrastructure for communications, as well as satellite positioning as part of broader systems to serve the needs of decision makers at the local and national and global scale, trying to improve sustainability, particularly with a focus on food, water and energy. So I'll give you several examples, and I want to again highlight the colleagues who played a role, particularly Ufoma Oviemida, Jack Reed, Neil Gaikwad, and Seamus Lombardo. These are graduate students in our team. And we'll talk about a few cases of projects where we're currently asking, how can we use the latest ability in both data analysis as well as data collection to contribute to the challenges facing us today? Part of the story is looking at the availability of satellite-based data around the environment. And this draws from the work of NASA. Here I'm highlighting NASA's Earth Observation Fleet but of course there's amazing fleets also available, especially from Europe, from Japan, from many other countries, including India and Brazil and China, and many of them share their data either freely or through agreements. And there's opportunities to draw from the group on earth observation to better understand the global environment for satellite data, both imagery, but also of course data that takes measurements of what's happening in the oceans, on land and in the sea, as well as in the atmosphere. Now, of course, part of the question here is how does all that come together to influence decision making for agriculture? And we want to also consider that there's a broad change as we look at both traditional larger government satellites that tend to have multiple instruments and, and act for maybe decades. Here, this example from NASA Terra has been in space for about two decades. And we compare that to the satellites available from commercial organizations like the company Planet that have a different engineering design and provide complementary data. Our team strives to find the balance in using both the traditional scientific satellites as well as the commercial satellite imagery. From the traditional scientific satellites, we are getting global measurements of things like rainfall and snowfall, and this can build on information around what's happening in the oceans. Of course, ocean temperature influences rain, which influences the ability for people to grow crops. So I draw this from my hydrology colleagues who talk about their use of this kind of data in land data assimilation models, trying to understand both current and upcoming seasonal expectations for how we expect to see the health of crops and other types of greenery. This information is available and actually it can be freely downloaded both a video, but also the actual data itself. But then the question becomes, can it be used in a useful way to actually inform decision making, whether for research or for operations? This example highlights some of the key steps that are required in any project using satellite data or other geospatial data to make a difference in decision making. And here on this picture, I'm showing three steps or five steps shown in green, which are particularly done uh, by government teams. So for example, as NASA operates a set of satellites, they provide many of the services in steps one to five. They operate satellites, they make the data available, and they often put the data in a place that can be visualized and discovered. But they often leave a role for the private sector, especially on the side of transforming the data into useful information and combining it with other data sets to eventually make decision support tools that provide recommendations for action. And these three steps of six, seven, and eight can be really a challenge because it means combining teams with different kinds of knowledge and asking what information is already available and needs to be created. And it's an ongoing challenge that is a design process, both at organizations like NASA, at universities, and with similar agencies around the world. 
in our team in particular at Space Enabled, we are addressing this challenge with a modeling framework called EVDT. In particular, it stands for Environment, Vulnerability, Decision Making, and Technology. So with the same idea in mind that we want to draw all the available data that's needed to address key questions for environmental challenges that also have great impact on social outcomes. We assume we need to bring in data from both models and from direct observations, whether it's from satellites, from drones, from in-situ measurements. We also need to combine that with the relevant socioeconomic data and of course draw from the expertise of social scientists and ask what's the proper way to combine the information. Then we can ask decision makers, which could be individual farmers or could be leaders in a city or a village or at the national scale, ask what decision are they trying to make and how would they use this information to shape their decision making. We could then have them actually directly use this data and take action, or we could imagine simulating that decision uh, with an engineering model, for example, like an agent-based model. The last piece is the des designed uh, technology model for asking what will be the next phase of technology we implement in the system. That is, does the decision maker need better data about the environment by implementing a new project, perhaps adding more satellite data, implementing new sources of data from the ground. So we've been implementing this concept of the EBDT framework in several cases, and I'll show you a few examples coming up. I also want to highlight that recently my team hosted a series with the Secure World Foundation called Serving Society with Space Data. And we went through several examples of the sustainable development goals and highlighted cases of particular SDGs and how satellite earth observation and other related tools can be used to address that topic. In particular, we had one week focused on SDG number two for zero hunger. I just wanna appreciate our speakers who I'm showing here on the screen and how you can access a recording of this hour and a half long discussion uh, hosted by my colleague, Dr. Mini Rathasbapathy. And she was able to moderate a great discussion both with scholars and with people who are working directly in policy issues related to food security. I think you'll really enjoy that discussion. So I'll close with three examples from our group Space Enabled, highlighting ways that we're currently adapting satellite observation data, as well as data from drones and in situ measurements to address particular policy questions facing scientists and decision makers in the government related to the food, water, energy nexus. I'm starting with the example of terrestrial ecosystems in wetlands in coastal Africa. This project is funded by the NASA Applied Sciences Program and particularly draws on scientific research from biospheric scientists, especially Dr. Lola Patiembo, Dr. David Lagavacino. And we bring in that knowledge and coordinate closely with scientists and policymakers in the countries of Benin and Ghana. One example is that we're looking at what you might be not directly agriculture, but it's a lake highly impacted by agricultural activity, meaning it's a lake at the end of a river where there's agricultural activity happening on the water, influencing the quality of the lake. And the lake is a place where fishing is one of the main food security options. So we're asking the question, how is the water quality influencing the growth of an invasive plant called the water hyacinth that plays a key role? It's a vegetation that is both desirable and undesirable. It often blocks activity on the lake and affects the oxygen balance, but it also plays a role in creating jobs. The company Green Key for Africa hires local people in the community to harvest the plant and use it for commercial goods. It actually can be used as a dried system, as a sorbent to uh, clean up oil spills. We're working with Greenkeeper Africa and other local scientists from the university there to ask the question how we can use satellite data to map the growth of water hyacinth and also consider as the local teams are considering how does the behavior of farmers upstream and upriver affect the water quality in the lake and what kind of agreement should they come to for issues of integrated water resource management affecting both the food security of the fishers and the food security of the farmers. Eventually we hope to turn this into a tool that can be used people can go online and see data from satellites, from drones, and from in-situ water sensors to better understand their system integration. Another example comes from Brazil, where again we're looking at food security from the point of view of the health of mangroves enabling fishing in an area that's actually quite urban in Rio de Janeiro. A student, Jack Reed, is leading this work and traveling several times a year to Rio de Janeiro when, when possible, right now not possible due to COVID. He's working with local scientists at the university, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and also working with the city of Rio government. And we're asking the question, how can just a tool based on the EVDT model, environment, vulnerability, decision, and technology, how can it help discussions by the city on how to address the management of land, in particular the conservation of a regional mangrove collection, which is one of the last mangrove forests in the area. The mangrove collection also addresses how local people who live in traditional lifestyles are doing local fishing and how their socioeconomic viability will go forward. So we're applying all the types of data we mentioned and environmental measurements, also looking at socioeconomic changes and the policy question of when should the government employ certain techniques for conservation. 
In this example, we can see a case where we can look at the satellite view and just get a visual summary, but also with the help of colleagues from NASA Goddard, we developed methodologies to map where mangroves are growing and get a sense for whether they're increasing or decreasing over time. This all goes into a tool developed by our student, Jack Reed, who's asking the question, can we make an interactive tool to enable dialogue and even design workshops with local leaders, both those who are leading the fishing activities and those who are leading the policy making, to have a dialogue about what kind of priorities they want to make in the future for mangrove management. This goes back to a food security issue as well as a land use issue, and it's part of a broader set of city policies. Actually, we found that this technique was also highly relevant during the era of COVID, and ultimately we created this tool called the VITA Decision Support System to use the same type of framework to ask, how can we use the same thoughts, adding in public health data, and have a similar decision-making tool for COVID management. I'll close with one more example coming from India and the student Neil Gaikwad. He's addressing the question of how to use artificial intelligence aligned with also data from satellites. He's done a lot of ethnographic research with farmers in India and a place he's very familiar with from his childhood. And he's asking how they can use more data, but also their own local knowledge and combine that from both sort of internationally available data and local data. And he's creating a phone app that can provide information where the local people collect data about their own farms and share it with the necro people via their phones, but that's also combined with data from satellites. And ultimately we ask questions around how they can best make decisions, but also understand issues like pricing of crops and other challenges that might affect their ability to move forward. All this work comes together to ask, what's the best way to use the current technologies in a way that definitely responds to the local goals and needs of leaders, whether they're companies, nonprofits, or governments who are trying to work for sustainable development in their own communities? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wood, for uh, your presentation on designing with space in mind um, and, and some really inspiring examples of where we can uh, look at and manage and measure and manage and engage with the full complexity of, of what is agricultural research for development, balancing all of these different goals. So I'd like to invite you all to join us in the Whova chat uh, for a live question and answer uh, session joining uh, uh, Dr. Palm, Professor Wood, and myself. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a uh, question and answer session with Dr. Palm and Professor Wood. I'm Brian King. I am coordinator of a big data platform. Um, and so we've got an opportunity to engage more directly with our experts on how do we manage this almost staggering complexity. We've seen examples where, um, you know, we're talking about measurements and and defining the kinds of measurements um, through the sustainable in intensification indicators framework. And then we've seen a, a decision framework, which also involves lots of measurements of data, obviously, about how do we harness earth, earth observation data and, uh, and local design and local measurement around um, uh, localized solutions. And so um, one of the first questions I have, I think we can get us started is, where do you see the points of intersection between uh, EVDT as a decision framework and the sustainable intensification indicators framework, which is obviously about measuring, trying to get a handle on and measure such, such vast complexity? Yeah, so would Maybe you like me to get started? Ready? Now? Go ahead. Sure, yeah, uh, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, the sustainable intensification indicators, as you saw, are lots and lots of different domains for sustainability. Um, and there are many lists. Um, how do you get the relevant ones selected, I think, are critical. And I think um, also, how do you measure them to keep it cost effective? And I think uh, how this interacts with what Danielle talked about is really the processes, the social processes that start to kick in. Once you have these huge lists, what are important to the stakeholders in terms of reaching the goals of a project? And so that's, I was quite surprised to see how much our different approaches actually start to converge when you look at, okay, so what do we actually do and who needs to be there? to get these indicators and decisions made for the right people and for the right reasons. I totally agree, Cheryl. And what's wonderful is that on my side, the environment, decision, and uh, vulnerability and technology, the EVDT aspect is asking, is there a decision that a stakeholder needs to make 
either in terms of official leadership like a government position or in terms of actions taken by participants in a community. So we could then ask, uh, if they're making a decision, what metrics should they use to determine if the decision should go a certain direction? And ideally, they could use metrics like the ones you're recommending as an example of ways to decide which way to go forward. And there may be metrics coming from the environmental aspects, the social vulnerability or social benefits aspects, as well as policy changes. This could all be potential. We can imagine having examples of your uh, indicators in the environmental modeling, socioeconomic modeling, and even the policy modeling, depending on which ones are most important. And so part of the question becomes, as we first scope out what problem is being addressed and uh, what are the different points of view on the problem, ideally there's a community-oriented dialogue process to determine which metrics are most important for the particular problem that's relevant, which is why our EVDT modeling framework is not static. It's really just a set of questions and options that can be brought together through a series of standards to exchange data across different models. But we expect that each time it's implemented in a local region, say a city or, or a lake region, a watershed, it might be done differently, but it's still following the overall framework and then get, taking an example of those kinds of indicators. Thank you. Uh, so there are several questions that kind of touch on this question about community engagement, design, um, of design of solutions, and even deciding what is important to measure in, in a particular context. And I'd be interested in hearing from both of you um, how you approach that problem. Um, Cheryl, why don't you start us up and uh, take into account what you learned from Danielle. Yeah. Okay, so as, as we've gone around uh, working with teams, looking at uh, sustainable intensification in many countries, um, we start with bringing um, stakeholders together, often starting with researchers just to see what their research objectives are and to tease out from them what do they think the indicators are um, to really track the progress of that. And sometimes you really have to start probing them. Many are just field scientists, agronomists who are focused on that and sometimes they don't think about the economics, the gender aspects. And once I asked somebody who was looking at planting trees um, for fruits and all soil fertility, and I said, are there impacts on women about planting trees? And this was in Africa. And the response was, well, why is that important? And so you really have to say, well, maybe the women don't own those trees or the land. And so to bring out the, the holistic view of what sustainability is. So it's critical even for the researchers to start thinking about what's critical to track. I really uh, appreciate that comment, Cheryl. And I can just add the idea that uh, when I do projects like these, where especially I showed examples in my talk of work we're doing in Brazil, in Benin, we also have similar projects in Ghana, we're starting activity in Indonesia. In these locations, I'm only working there because someone in the country invited me to go. So it's a case where first, the first stage is that uh, there's a local leader, either in the government or university context, or perhaps a, a company that has a particular development vision, first that I find you know, inspiring, that I believe in. So I'm there because they invited me or somehow we met and, and they sort of opened into having me there. So the first ang angle is that I'm a guest when I'm in the country. So there's really a local leader who's driving the definition of what's important and I'm sort of trusting that they're also doing a process and I can observe they're doing a process that uh, is really uh, inclusive of people in the community. We have to ask them, how are they considering the past forms of injustice and oppression that may be affecting perhaps women, uh, people of different age groups, people of different class groups, because in almost every part of the world, there are traditional patterns that have caused oppression to different groups. So we have to ask how our design will not make that worse, but actually make it better. And the next phase is that I draw from a tradition called system architecture. I'm, my original training is in engineering, but part of what engineers have done to become more relevant to social needs is to use uh, kind of tools from design thinking. System architecture gives a series of, of key questions to ask. The first is that we do a, con a context analysis, asking what's happening locally, both historically and currently, in the socioeconomic, the policy, the social domain. The next phase is then we should ask, uh, who are the different kinds of stakeholders? Often we identify them as primary, secondary, and tertiary, it's just as drawing from uh, other literatures that kind of use stakeholder analysis. Primary decision makers have often the, the ability and the, and the official role to make decisions, but secondary decision makers and stakeholders get to influence the primary stakeholders in a formal way. And tertiary stakeholders are important because they are often those who receive the benefits and the impact of a system, perhaps a design or an, an, an intervention to have a kind of a new policy or a new approach to farming. 
but they are often those who don't have an official or formal role in policymaking, but they do have a, a direct impact on what happens with the policymaking or the plan or the, the new scientific method. So we like to ask, oh, who's considering the needs of these tertiary stakeholders and are they really uh, having an opportunity to share their view uh, through our community development process? So ideally we have an assessment of the needs and the objectives and ultimately ask if there's a fair process to really consider this with broad range of stakeholders. And then that can feed into the implementation of a tool like Environment Vulnerability Decision Technology, the EVTD framework, and hopefully also implement a particular way to collect data and to use that data for improving local agricultural and environmental outcomes. Fantastic. Um, there's a question that's come through that uh, is for both of you, and it's a, a, a framed a bit more broadly. It's about how can we use remote sensing technology in agriculture production more specifically um, in light of sustainability? And um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Baum. Okay, so I interact with people that look at different remote sensing tools. They can start measuring productivity in DBI at fairly large scales. But I think more and more there's more fine scale because there are other questions about scale um, and use of tools for drones. There are a lot of uh, new tools for looking at drones and productivity, but also the whole issue about sustainability. There's more and more tools, remote sensing tools to look at diversity of cropping systems um, and, and issues like that. There's a lot about soil moisture from remote sensing tools so I think people are starting to get them. It's then how you all integrate them. And I think that's some of the exciting uh, things that will be discussed during this week. I've looked through the different uh, topics being discussed, and I think many of these issues are front and center for this week. And just building on that, I'd like to share an experience I had before my current position. Currently, I work at MIT, but my last job was based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And I had the privilege of working alongside several other scientists to help uh, NASA start a new project. They called it uh, a Food and Agriculture Consortium. They're looking at uh, addressing food security more directly with NASA tools, especially NASA satellite data. And they had an opportunity to competitively select an organization. We had multiple uh, uh, groups apply. And NASA selected uh, the University of Maryland to lead a consortium over about a five-year period uh, to really emphasize research in the area of using satellite data and other space-related uh, tools and models uh, for food security and agriculture. And I learned a lot through this process. And you can go to the website for uh, nasaharvest.org, where you can see the ongoing work of this group from the uh, University of Maryland. Where they brought together multiple universities and organizations. And some of the key items that are emphasized through this kind of program is there's been a long tradition of using uh, Landsat as a series of data, and more recently Sentinel, to get the traditional NDVI measurements just to understand uh, through a season what's happening with the health of the crop. And of course, uh, as we mentioned, the land data assimilation models uh, gives an even more refined analysis for a region, especially if you can be customized to that region. You know, meaning it's great that folks at NASA Goddard, I want to mention Krista Peters Ladard and her work, um, but they're often so sort of taking, let's, let's consider a particular uh, zone of the earth and, and say, uh, do we have the right assumptions for uh, the on the ground you know, stream flows as well as the rainfall for that region? And can we combine estimates of the oceanographic uh, temperatures and then look at the overall rainfall and see how that affects uh, the patterns and have a combination of measurements of soil moisture and NDVI. So that's the, the really wonderful state of the art we're seeing. And of course, the Famine Early Warning System Network has been operating for a number of decades, a collaboration between the United, US uh, AID and NASA. And they do produce already food security alerts regularly for many countries in Africa. And the next generation that I'm seeing is increasing the use of radar data as a satellite-based uh, data set to consider uh, getting different kinds of information about the health of crops. Um, but certainly we're also asking how uh, companies that are offering commercial data that might give more frequent updates than Landsat or Sentinel, that's an another way to people to think. And there's new uh, questions being explored, how to use uh, data from this commercial imagery that's a different kind of data set from the traditional scientific measurements uh, that can add different kinds of insight. But we, the question partly is uh, what size scale can you ask? Can you Are you looking at a big industrial farm or perhaps at smaller family owned farms? And you might need different kinds of data for these different scale farms. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, there's a question uh, specifically for you, but I think we can we can uh, massage it so that it's actually a, a more general question as well. So the specific question is about uh, the application of uh, the EVTT 
decision framework, um, and there was a specific case in India. And uh, the the person who's asking the question is that they're they're look, they want to know more about how the data was uh, protected. And um, now for the massaging part, you know, we can talk about. There's a broader theme here about data annotation, data management, data interoperability, so you can continually, you know, learn and relearn and and, and increasingly, um, you know, uh, ask complex questions of a complex world. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the particular data protection question, but also a bit about the management and interoperability question. And we can um, we can also ask, uh, see what uh, what, what Cheryl's um, views on the, are that on as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. I noticed that there's a question overall also asking, can EBDT be used in a variety of different contexts? I, I do want to reassure the audience that EBDT is a very flexible framework. I showed examples from uh, mangrove growth and also from invasive plant needs. But yes, it's meant to be something that can be used across a number of different uh, topic areas. And each time it should be adapted to that local area and to that local topic. So that means, of course, that the question of what kind of uh, data privacy and interoperability is needed will be somewhat customized to the local situation. And that's partly why I mentioned uh, part of the goal is to sort of ask oh, who's inviting us to work in this area and what are their key stakeholder needs and concerns, both the, the decision-making stakeholders, but also the beneficiaries, those who will end up being the ones who benefit from the system that's being put in place. So certainly on the privacy side, part of our goal as often, again, as guests who are involved with a, a country, maybe it's outside of our own home, we're asking the question, uh, not how can we as a group from a university like MIT, we don't want to be holding uh, data over the long term that's sort of uh, private to an organization. Now, on one hand, uh, for example, I showed uh, that we're working in a place in Benin, and some of the data we're talking about using is satellite imagery of a large lake where I would say it's actually not very private, meaning we're sort of um, creating data about public information that could be observed if you were walking around on the street. So that's one category. In the case of India, of course, there's a case where we're talking about uh, working with uh, groups who might collect data about their own farms. Again, things that could be seen if you were passing by. And But our goal often is to ask, can local organizations become the ultimate bearers who really can store the data over the long term? Meaning we at the university might play the role initially to set up a prototype system that does store data, but we'd like to also find local uh, nonprofit groups or government groups uh, that can ultimately kind of own these systems over the long term so that we aren't necessarily the ones um, who are in the control of the data from other people. Uh, if there's a need for partnership, we'll have to kind of ask in each case, you know, what's the best way to put the right security in place? But a lot of the data we're talking about could be observed by the public, so to speak, if they were passing by these fields or if they were involved with these lakes. So we try to consider data that wouldn't be truly private to the individual without their permission or, or their suggestions on privacy. Yeah. Dr. Palm, anything to add on data? data standards, data privacy, from your perspective? Well, I work more at the ground level doing household surveys and, and things like that, very often with information that could, should be considered private. So through universities, there is a very stringent process for obtaining permission first to go out and do those surveys. It requires um, permissions from communities and the local um, research groups. And so I think that way it's protected in the kind of data that can be shared. It has to be anonymized, uh, all identifiers removed so that you can't just walk into an area and say, hey, I heard you say this about yourself. And so I think there really are um, practices in place and policies, and those are international policies. So from the ground side, I think it's really um, works. And again, at some of the geospatial data, it's there, it's public. And so you have to be careful how you don't link people that you don't want them to be tracked. It's really critical, and that's a big concern a lot of people have when you start getting big data, how to protect the privacy of people. Absolutely. Um, so just to note to everybody, we are, we're, we're capturing uh, questions in the chat. And even if we run out of time, we'll continue to be capturing questions in the chat, and we can we can continue to engage um, even if our live uh, portion of this uh, of this engagement comes uh, comes to a close, or even after it does. Um, so there's um, there's a, a question about data types, really. It's about what kind what type of space data do you wish you had access to for agriculture? Are 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 the um, uh, uh, the data types currently available meeting needs, or should, could they could they be better, 
or more available or um, more fit for purpose for agriculture in some way. Shall I start that one? Please, please, so, yeah. Yeah, from my viewpoint, I think some of this very fine resolution uh, satellite imagery is really exciting, um, especially working in smallholder agriculture. I think that's what you really need in some of these situations to understand diversity, landscape patterns and all of that. But up until now, it's been extremely difficult to really interpret those due to the large amount of data. And so I think a lot of it is there and it's how to link them together like Danielle talks about from adding, you know, broader scale data to these finer scale um, images. So that's what I'd be excited to see how we can use those more for small scale farming applications. I fully agree that the smaller scale farms is partly where we see the limits or the interesting kind of questions around what's available. And so my team is often asking, when is, is, when is it most useful to consider a satellite based data source, an airborne source, uh, data sources that can be uh, right there on the ground with either cell phone cameras or um, people's observations and surveys? And how do we best combine them? And we often are talking about this trade off because satellite data gives you really interesting regional views, especially when you're first trying to understand what's happening in a region. And often if you have a series of small farms and they're experiencing issues like drought or like water shortage or pests, those are gonna happen at the regional scale. So that's one kind of question. If you're talking about the experience of an individual farmer trying to optimize how they want to apply um, water or crop rotation, considering the soil chemistry, that's kind of a, a small scale question, but uh, you'd like to understand how it relates to you know, so the, the neighboring context. So ideally we, we want to have, have no gaps all, at all times in sort of regional scale data and uh, local you know, uh, farm scale data. And of course, it'd be nice if there was sort of constant uh, physics that allowed us to have constant observation of the satellites. But on, on the other hand, I think even if we had that kind of data, um, we would have almost more data that we could process because that's already true right now. So it's, it's kind of a give and take, meaning on one hand, we kind of wish we had more data, but on the other hand, we're still learning to use the data types that we have so we haven't sort of finished learning how to combine mobile phone based data with data from uh, sort of soil sensors with data from uh, drone ob observations and data from satellites, both uh, medium and high resolution. So I think we can keep working on that. Uh, meanwhile, for uh, years to come, we'll, we'll see additional uh, increase uh, by various teams or at different government agencies. We're gonna bring uh, fresh soil moisture sensors, for example. We're gonna see more opportunities to uh, see different forms of hyperspectral data coming from the space station, for example. So there's gonna be uh, new ideas. I take the example of SWAT, uh, which is an upcoming mission from NASA that will give us, again, a, just a fresh view on vegetation that we haven't had before. And it's gonna, we're gonna be able to combine our understanding of what's happening in the atmosphere and what's happening uh, in the soil in fresh ways. So I think there's still fun opportunities to combine these new scientific data sets plus the imagery that's coming on board due to various uh, commercial companies. So I think we haven't yet exhausted um, our options in how to combine the data. Plus the idea that the models themselves is what really gives us this idea of having information without gaps. And I just, uh, for example, add to the chat, uh, some of the examples of the land data simulation models that I've learned the most from. And they are really the, the ability to sort of take any data that we might have and sort of continue to, to bring it in to the models, even um, whether there's gaps or not, we can still benefit a lot from that through the models. So um, as you may know, um, CGIR is a, uh, we're a, we're a global organization of agricultural research institutes and going through a process now of, um, of kind of greater unification and greater, greater um, um, you know, sort of uh, um, be, becoming a more cohesive organization and, and operating on a, under a sort of refreshed uh, overall strategy that we're calling one CGIAR. And so there's a question in the chat about uh, what would um, a, a unified global public interest organization doing, doing research in the public good, what role could we play uh, what role could one CGIR play in um, accelerating digitization of agriculture? Any views on that? Maybe we'll start with Cheryl. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I do think probably throughout the CGIR, there are a lot of these tools that Danielle was talking about and people that are innovating, making them from soil sensors to remote sensing of drones to satellite imagery and things. But I think they are scattered about the CGIAR. It's individual scientists in many cases and individual projects. 
And I think part of the one CGIAR is to bring those together so that it brings together those diverse tools, the diverse scientists to come together around a particular problem. So I, I do think um, there are real opportunities now and the one CGIAR I think could really provide a way forward how to bring these talents together um, from soil sensors to remote sensing and how they interact to solve problems. So I, I think it's an exciting time. The tools are around, the people are there, and I think the CG can provide a structure to allow that collaboration that's really required to solve these complex problems. I fully agree that's with that. Another opportunity. Oh, just Please. to highlight uh, another way to kind of build on what Cheryl was saying, another opportunity is also to link with organizations that are also international and have related complementary missions. One that comes to mind is the group on Earth Observation, which particularly brings together professionals and uh, national member states who are interested in propagating the benefits of remote sensing for various uh, space applications in society. And so often there's a case where a group might be in an um, organization focused on space data, for example, and they would like to be able to serve organizations like CGIAR in a way that says, okay, you are all the experts in agriculture and we have something to offer and we'd like to be able to sort of channel our results to those who need it the most. And so I think uh, also liaising with other international groups that have sort of um, options and available resources to, to kind of track uh, is one way to sort of get the benefit because there's actually so many networks that are uh, bringing together these kinds of tools often in parallel. So being able to make, I think we all need to be there, but kind of making more links across these global networks is one way to move forward as well. Fantastic. Um, so I guess it's to both of you. And um, this is a bit uh, uh, about um, you, the the link between we talked about, you know, eyes in the sky and sensors on the ground. And there's a very specific question about um, uh, integrating soil testing into small scale farming and how that's uh, this kind of you know persistent constraint in, in enabling smallholder systems. Is there a role in satellite imagery and remote sensing in helping to sort of overcome that constraint as we engage with with smallholder small farming systems? Well, being a soil scientist, I think people Oh no. I was very interested to hear what uh, Gerald um, said. <laughs> it's agriculture and Zoom. They were right. Actually, it's not. It's well, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a we have a wrap up question. Yeah, and it's yeah. Sure, please. Yeah. Mm. I was just going to highlight that I think there's two ways to think about it. One is to ask, what have been the traditional techniques, not necessarily from um, scientific measurements, but from local knowledge, perhaps indigenous knowledge to that, to that area, to understand the health of soil, perhaps also through questions such as, what have been traditional methods of crop mixing and crop rotation that also would be relevant? So I think that's, that's a very ground-based and sort of a local historical-based question. And the next question I would ask is, um, what do we see on the regional scale, meaning uh, is there a known concern for desertification or for kind of regional change or lack of access to water to be considered? I think satellites are particularly strong. Uh, if something's going to affect multiple farmers at once, uh, then we're going to get uh, really good information from the satellite side. If you're looking at the individual um, individual plot that might be you know, uh, at the scale of, of one family, uh, I think the question might be, uh, how can they sort of uh, play a role to help validate? It's one of the ideas that we have uh, with our, our project in India, we're asking local farmers to help us validate whether we're making good estimates at the sort of satellite scale, which might be more regional, uh, to see if that information is relevant to their local area. So I think part of the question is, can, can the local measurements kind of collaborate with the regional um, analysis and see if it makes sense at the local scale? Um, but I'd love to have Cheryl uh, comment further. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I've had real internet problems today, and I've forgotten what the question was as I panicked here. <laughs> 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 We've talked about eyes in the sky and we've talked about sensors on the ground. And so there's a question about how can remote sensing be part of the solution for, for getting more localized soil analysis into how smallholder farming systems work, you know? Um, and um, and uh, Daniel had some great observations about local knowledge and traditional knowledge and looking at crop rotation and then looking at kind of larger, you know, landscape and even larger scale, regional scale around um, around soils 
And um, that's that's where we were when you were getting back, connected back in. So we'd love to hear your views on that. And we'll have yeah, a I just think. Yeah, you know, I just think the remote sensing um, provides a broader scale look, and I think li linking then to diversity. I think soils are so diverse at small scale that it's difficult to actually get that from remote sensing. But there are maps now, a lot generated by people in the CGIR that help us start looking at soils and uh, important properties of soils for productivity. But it's then making those local links. What are the major practices in that will really help you think? What are the major soil management issues? Fantastic. Um, and so wrapping up question, um, although we can continue to engage over the chat. Um, so one of the one of the advantages we really discovered pretty quickly of doing a virtual convention is that you can really engage all over the world at the same time. And so we've seen um, a lot of youth, students, people thinking about their careers joining. Um, and um, I was just wondering if you have any suggestions for um, what they might uh, consider as they look at their own uh, their own path in their technical fields. I can just briefly encourage uh, to get involved with the Space Generation Advisory Council. They can go to just spacegeneration.org. It's an opportunity to be involved with people in every region of the world. There are local chapters, and there are people who care about applying technology, such as satellite data and other technologies that are emerging today uh, to address societal needs. And they can start to be involved with local projects. And the ult ultimate activity is this group delivers results and uh, recommendations to the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. And several people from the overall volunteer pool attend their meetings when they're normally happening in person. So it's a great way to get involved as a young professional or a current student uh, with a network of people who care about these issues of using data in a way that helps society. I, I formerly sat on the board of advisors for this group, and I certainly recommend getting involved. So we're moving on to our next panel. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Cheryl Palm and Professor Danielle Wood. And um, we'll be able to continue to engage in the chat over any of the questions and discussions that we've had so far. Thank you.